My name is Richard Greaves. I've been a screen printer since 1979. I was born into a landscape family. Uh, my grandfather was a landscape contractor and he had a nursery and I literally grew up in the middle of his nursery. My father was a landscape architect and I did that until I was 27 years old. And at 27 years old, I wasn't making any money. And so I ran away from home and I joined the circus. And that circus would be the screen printing world. I had a friend who I'd actually done some work with that uh, was now running a, a flag company. And that was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Eater Manufacturing. And I, I went there to be a, a, a screen maker to start with, but they, actually didn't have that job for me. They had me doing production control, which was, I was very well suited for. And after a while they said, you know, Richard should run the shop. And I went, I, I've got nice clothes on again. I, I want to be in the executive area. But boom, I was running the shop. And of course for me, I didn't know how to run a shop. I had to learn on the job. I could run the building, I could run the business, but I had to learn screen printing on the job. The, the idea of starting out, you, you need to understand the fundamentals because without the basics, you're not really going to be able to grow at all. And once you have the fundamentals, then you can develop your own style. And that would be the branding that has become so popular in the last <coughs> few years, although branding's been around for as long as I've been around, and so branding is not anything new, but the style of what your business means, what people think of, that's the brand. The other part is that I think it's real important that you make money, and that's why we usually go into business, and if you're not paying attention to whether or not you're making a profit, I think that's the, you know, that's going to turn out to be the, the the biggest mistake also, which you're going to ask me in a few few minutes, but it's understanding the risk that you're going to take. So if you've never screen printed before, you don't really understand the risks. And that may be what you really need to focus on in, in the beginning if you're going to grow. And you need to, of course, anticipate how you're going to grow. There's so many different departments that have to grow at the same speed because if you get a large jump in sales, but your screen making or your, your cash flow can handle it, and almost all risk seems to come back to cash and money, whether you've got emergency money or mad money or the ability to say, oh my goodness, this guy is selling his shop at a bargain. I could pick these up if I only had $8,000 and nobody in your family wants to know. Well, that's a good segue from the question that I just answered in that you need to grow in a balanced method. And so everybody wants to buy a printing press, but I'd like to see people buy a bigger oven first. Um, if you get a brain, you know, if you have a, a small quantity manual printing press and it's got a small oven to go along with it because you're only putting out three shirts a minute, any little oven can handle that. The big problem is that now you get yourself an automatic press and you can do three, four, five, six hundred an hour just to be an average printer. And it doesn't matter how many colors you're printing, you're still loading at the top speed. You're going as fast as that press can handle it. And no small oven can handle 600. You need to all of a sudden get a large oven. The other big problem is that where are you going to store the shirts? Where are you going to get more screens? There's all the ancillary products that have to help. And you'll burn through a 600 shirt job in one hour. And now what are you gonna do? Send everybody home? Because you've got to have enough work. You've got to have the cash flow. Again, I'll bring that up again. Cash flow is so important because you may get all the work and then you will run out of cash because people haven't paid you yet. And so it, it can be a, a self-fulfilling death prophecy that you may not be happy at all with how it actually happened. So growing slow is important and having money covers up a multitude of sins. If you're going to grow, it is so much more productive, shall we say, to be able to create a second shift, except then you need people you can really trust. Because if you can use the same equipment, but just have three people, 
that will run that same printing press. It didn't cost you anything, but that's a problem because you need to be able to leave those people alone. Or, as I did in the mid in the uh, the mid '80s, you got to work 17-hour days, get to work at seven o'clock, and leave at 11:30. When you asked me this before, or you mentioned that, it, I, I've been thinking for at least a half hour now of anybody that I ever hired that really cared about the business. And I've had shops that I've run that had 100 people in them, um, and I've had shops that, that I've run that only had like 15 or 20 people. And you can get good workers, but anybody that sort of lived and breathed and was really interested in screen printing or the art. So it has been art that has usually brought people to me. Nobody says, gee, I'd like to be a screen maker. Gee, I'd like to be a printer. They usually come with a real interest because they want to do art or they want to sell shirts. You know, how many people do we know that have started with bands or skateboarders or people that are in that kind of culture and they know they can sell shirts. So it's the selling of the shirts is addictive, but that's usually only one person and they want to start their own entrepreneurial business. But to find other employees, that's tough. I don't know that I can, that I can uh, say that I've ever really had anybody that, that wanted to work in a screen printing shop that had that, that bite, except art people. And they usually want to do their own art. And so people who went to art school, they want to do things that are in a rectangle. They have to go into a frame like what we have here in this, in this room. So I've had an awful lot of fabulous girl artists, but you got to tell them that the background of the shirt, that's, the, that, that's your canvas. And so you need to create things that don't need to be in a nice square, like an album cover or a CD cover. I've encouraged all the people that have worked for me when I started out when people still did hand drawing. Now that is so rare, but there were no computers in my earlier days. And I encouraged my people to draw for at least an hour a day on my time because they need to keep their skills up and I wanted to know what their stuff looked like. And then if I could sell to the Speedo company what you like to draw, it's a double win. Um, the biggest mistake is not really understanding the process or procedures. And they get to a situation where they're too busy to work on it. And I've seen this time and time again in my consulting career. And I've been all over the world and I've been in hundreds and hundreds of shops. And they'll say, I can't stop to try and put in these new procedures or try and train and do new things. So Henry Ford taught us about the assembly line. And what we do is not assembly line kind of work. It is, the order comes in, the art gets made, the screens get made. So in many ways it is kind of an assembly line, except it's a creative assembly line where we're expected to bring humanity to that process. And if you just want robots, like Henry Ford, you've got to build exactly the same thing every time. And as we know that every five years, the industry gets some sort of an upheaval. So we're all now on another water base extravaganza, which is what happened in 1980 and 1995. And then there was a discharge revolution in 2005. And now it seems like the water base is going to take over the world. So these things go in cycles and the procedures that if you don't stop and work on the process so that your company understands how to use the process, the, the, the jobs will take care of themselves. Getting the jobs out will take care of themselves. It's when you're just trying to get work out, you're busy being busy, that's a catastrophe. Uh, I've used restaurant analogies through my entire writing career. And I've never worked in a restaurant, but the whole idea of the tireless, never-ending, mundane work of working in a professional restaurant, the one thing that I hear from every restaurant tour, because now every big restaurant tour that's famous talks about working clean, that it, 
if you clean up as you're working and because you've got health and food inspectors that you'll literally be in huge amounts of problems if you don't work clean. So I'd say if I walk into a shop and it's clean and organized, if the tools are organized, somebody was thinking and there's a real process about that. It's very interesting that you're asking me this because the place that I'm going to send you to is Mark Coudray's video on Printavo. I'm forgetting exactly what the title of it is, but it has to do with pricing. Look for Mark Coudre and pay attention to that little 18 minute bit of wisdom. Mark and I have talked about these particular problems for over 25 years, more than that. And in the early days, we used to get together at impression shows like we're at right now. And he and I would meet up in a hotel lobby at 1130, talk till two in the morning. And typically, we'd both have a story about the guy that just chiseled us out of a nickel that, you know, I did the job, I did the work for them last time, and they went across the street to somebody else for a nickel. So there's always that problem of where they're going to go if they're going only for price. So you have to bring a value. You have to bring an experience. You have to bring more to it. Why do you want to go to certain restaurants? Why do you want to buy certain cars? Why do you want to go to certain hotels? The hotel room when you're sleeping in it is basically the same if it's a Holiday Inn Express or the Ritz Carlton. But when you, when you go to the Peninsula Hotel, they pick you up at the airport in a Rolls Royce. There's a different, now it costs a lot more money. Is the extra experience worth it? Are you providing a real service? I was just in some places the last two days buying tires. And I had to go to four completely different places because it was a hard problem to deal with. And the difference in customer service that I got, I went with the most expensive, mostly because they were the nicest and I knew it was going to get done better. So price didn't matter to me much. It was only a, f a few dollars uh, difference, but I had no problem going to the, to the better experience. But what Mr. Kudre teaches you in his video is that when you're looking at the profit that you make, that if you're going from, let's say, 1 to 50 prints and it's the same price, the 50th shirt is a different price than the 51st shirt, which you might go 51 to 99 or 51 to 100. The problem is, is that you will literally not get any profit when you print 51 shirts, whereas you will make a profit printing 50 shirts because you've dropped the price and what you're doing is you're dropping your profit. I'm not explaining this well in this short amount of time, but I, I, I want people to understand that they should be making a profit. Mr. Kudre introduced me to a book, uh, Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. And I think that every entrepreneur, especially entrepreneurs that don't have a lot of administrative staff, should be focusing on whether or not you're going after jobs that are making money. And there are many jobs that maybe you should turn down because, you know, uh, and, and I th don't even get me started on contract printing. I can't believe how many people I'm meeting that are very happy to do contract printing. And that scares me uh, a lot because there you have to be an expert printer. You got to move the work through the shop and you got to behave like you're in a pit stop to make money as a contract printer. Until you get a national reputation or a reputation of any sort and you've developed your own style, you've got the fundamentals, you've got to work locally. And so, the, especially in these internet days, if you become a community and you work on the community, you become a hub for the community, that once you've done business for one year, you know when the bowling league needs their shirts, you know when the baseball league needs their shirts, and this is a big problem that I that I ran into in, in Puerto Rico, that in Puerto Rico, I was doing consulting there, teaching people, and it was a sporting goods company. And they have four sporting seasons for baseball. And it always seemed that, that they were complaining that in the sporting goods store, they'd come two days before the opening day and say, ooh, we need uniforms. And pretty soon a salesman worth their salt would understand that if the baseball season starts on April 1st, maybe we should have a nice sheet that makes it totally easy to buy. And this is an internet lesson that every um, interface person has taught us 
that you need to make it easy to buy. And if you've experienced once where you get a bag full of 11 checks from 11 moms that, that want their basketball uh, tournament for their girls, and so you've got to deal with it, and you need to embrace that. If you're ready for it, it's not a problem. If you walk down a dark alley and there are a couple of salty looking dudes at the other end, and you're all alone and you've got $100 in your pocket, you're nervous. But if you walk down and you happen to have your baseball bat with you, it's not as nervous. You're prepared, you're mentally prepared to deal with anything that comes at you. And that's, I think that's, that's part, of the, uh, uh, part of helping the community. That if on your website you've got the community calendar, especially in a smaller town. Can't really do that in New York City or San Francisco, but if you're in a smaller town, you're starting up, you can be the, you know, and it's the, the things that you like. So it could be running, it could be basketball or motorcycles or who knows what hobbies you're interested in. You are that, that's probably the reason that you went into business. I've had so many people that said, you know, I'm quitting JCPenney. I know exactly who I can sell to, or they're a basketball f coach and they know that they can go to all the coaches in the, the tri-state area and sell to those people. So building the community so you are the guy that they come to because you're also promoting, you know, that if you're dealing with restaurant people one day and then you're dealing with basketball people the other, maybe you can put some of those people together. You could be the glue that keeps the community together. You're the guy that does those shirts. All mistakes are made in pre-press. That if the job does not go together well, it was a problem in pre-press. If the wrong mess was chosen, I don't know who, I don't really care whose, whose fault it was, it happened in pre-press. It's something that you could have fixed and you should learn from that, and most people don't. So they're not taking it and regurgitating and saying, ooh, let's not make sure that this never happens again. This is one of the basics of all lean manufacturing is to learn and to improve the process. And that's through education. Uh, I don't believe that screen printers really teach people about what they're actually doing. I also don't think that people really care that much. They just came to do the job. They're there to make money. And you, you asked me this before. Are there people that really are interested in, in the work? Every once in a while, you get somebody who really wants to learn about that. And then you take them to the library and they go, oh man, I had no idea you were gonna take me to the library and expect me to read books. I thought you'd just give me a few tips because everybody wants the little pill to take and there's no magic involved. So procedures, repeatable procedures, and then when people step, step out of that procedure or they know, you know, we've never done this sort of work before, we'd better check into this before we get to the press. Because the press is the most expensive piece of equipment in the shop. And if it's not running for the 435 minutes every single day, you're not going to make money. Um, a screen maker that is behind is going to cost us money because if you're waiting for screens every minute, cost you, let's say, six to seven to eight shirts on an automatic press. And that's just money that's going up in smoke. So pre-press that's not moving like a watch. And I have a, I have a favorite CNN video of a pit crew, the Williams Formula One racing crew, that I'm happy to send to anyone or I can put on the Printavo uh, the website. And it just shows how the, the, the Williams Formula One team have gotten a four tire change in filling up gasoline on a Formula One car down to 1.9 seconds. I can't turn my car off in 1.9 seconds, much less change all four tires. And you can't believe it until you actually see it. And people have to actually believe that they can do their work faster. This is again another principle of lean manufacturing, that once you get comfortable, take away some resources, reduce the time, try and compress the time, people will grumble, and then they'll figure out a way to do it. Without the pressure, the time pressure, or compression of, of you know, the, 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 the problem, people need pressure to get things done, otherwise everyone becomes complacent. Well, this is the YouTube Facebook generation. Um, the problem with that is that you're on a journey and you don't know if you're actually going to get the, you don't know if you're actually going to get the answer. 
Um, you've got to read, you know, on my airplane trip, I read an awful lot of, of uh, Q&A questions. Uh, first of all, I really don't like it when somebody asks a serious question and they're a novice, and then the smart Alex make jokes because a new person doesn't understand that you're joking. Otherwise, they wouldn't be asking that sort of a question. So the, 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 the guys are having a good laugh at your expense because you dared to ask a question, and I'm very bitter about that, as you can tell by my tone. But that's the problem with Facebook and YouTube is that you've got to kiss an awful lot of frogs until you find someone that you can actually trust or that their knowledge is actually understandable. So a book is going to solve that problem. And I come from a generation where the technical guidebooks from the Screen Printing Association, the SGIA, um, you know, there used to be 11 different binders that had all of the basic information. And if you'd read those, you had a very good liberal education in screen printing. The, the great thing about books is that they're a curated, complete assembly of what, you know, the author thought that you should know. It's more than a magazine article. It's very specific. It's been thought over. Whereas videos like this, they're kind of, you know, shooting from the hip, going fast, and anybody with a phone now can make a movie. And I love that. I love that part of it. But that means that you're crowdsourcing your information. And the problem is with technical skills, I don't think crowdsourcing is really the way to go. Because you can't tell Tony Sonic from Panasonic, my brother, many, many years ago, once brought back a radio that he bought from a kid at school. Look, it's a Tony Sonic. And my father and I looked at each other and went, oh, okay, uh, yes, that's fine. But if you can't tell when you're a novice, and that's the problem, that people are getting bamboozled or just distracted. Now, there, there, are, there are many experts that will say that their way is the only way. I think there's a million different ways that you can screen print, but there's a reason, there's a because. And most people on Facebook and, and YouTube don't come up with the because, they're not dealing with the actual science. And I'm very proud of my answers on the t-shirt forums and the, uh, all the Facebook uh, forums that I belong to, that when I answer a question, I expect that would be it. That I have explained that person's question. Now that's, you know, I'm all high and mighty saying that yes, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm answering the specific science question and there really isn't a lot of debate about science. It's not an opinion of what mesh should I use, nobody can tell you that and I'll usually say something like that. I'll say there is no one answer but there's a reason why you go a higher mesh or a lower mesh or a thinner thread or a thicker thread. And once you understand those fundamentals then you can come up with a style because you may like doing it your way and somebody else likes doing it the other way. There's no wrong way but there are more efficient ways or there's a reason that if you added a little more tension, you won't be wiping the bottom of the screen so much.